Welcome to a conversation with Tom Pike, Chief Executive Officer of Quintiles, the world's leading provider of, of biopharmaceutical services. I'm Ken Freeman, Allen Questrom Professor and Dean at the Boston University Questrom School of Business. Welcome, Tom. Glad to have you with us today. Uh, perhaps we could start our conversation by looking back into your background. Mm -hmm. uh, you majored in accounting in college, had a phenomenal career in consulting, and now you're leading one of the great healthcare companies in the world. How did it all happen for you? Well, that's a, that's a long story, Ken. I hope you have a little bit of time. But uh, you know, my, my college education was an interesting one. I had to pay for my own school. I ended up deciding to go accounting because I wanted the toughest business major at the time. And I, I felt, felt like that was a tough business major. I was always good at math. It actually came fairly easily to me. But interestingly, along the way, I had a professor who was a consultant. And that professor used to go to delicatessens and small businesses, and he would deal with the, you know, when they'd get a health inspection and there was a problem or profitability problems. And I thought, boy, it seems so interesting to have a person who goes from place to place to place. So when Arthur Anderson Consulting came to campus, I decided to go for the interview and started my career. And you were with Accenture, the successor company to Arthur Anderson Consulting, for over 20 years in your career. So it seems like consulting was really a, quite a great match for you. It really was. About half of my career has been in consulting, and the other half has really been in the operations and running those kinds of companies. But basically, I, I have two foundational elements of my career. I spent about five and a half years with the, the predecessor to Accenture, which was Arthur Anderson Consulting. And then I left and I became part of a company that was acquired by McKinsey. And McKinsey actually was very transformative for me because when I look back, I often think that McKinsey taught me how to think. It's a very special place in terms of the way they help you identify and analyze problems. And so it taught me how to think. And then Accenture, which I went back to later, taught me how to do. I was at Accenture and its predecessor over 22 years. So it was really a very significant part of my career, and I think it gave me the foundation stones I use today. So thinking and doing, both vitally important parts of successful leadership. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, maybe not so suddenly, but certainly along came Quintiles. Mm -hmm. uh, with a great career in consulting, uh, you made the leap to the other side of the fence. Uh, what was the, the provocation for that for you? Yeah, it was interesting. I was going through my career at Accenture, and it's a great company, continues to be a great company. And around 2010, I came to an important timing and age that I was 50 years old and I was on the executive committee of Accenture and I was looking forward at what I could do from there. And I got approached by a private equity firm, interestingly, about starting up a company in healthcare. And it was a very difficult decision. And I think in retrospect, when you think about your careers, you're never quite sure whether you made the right decision or not, especially when you're leaving a great company but I decided to go to that private equity company and we started up a, a healthcare company that serviced hospitals. Mm -hmm. But then after doing that for a while, this opportunity for Quintiles came along. And Quintiles is a very special company and I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit, but it's now 34 years old, a real leader in its field. And it seemed to be the perfect intersection between what I had done at Accenture and even McKinsey to some degree my interest in healthcare, which had really blossomed somewhat through how my own parents were treated by the healthcare system, and then a great company that had the need for an executive of that, that kind of skill set. So it all came together, and now I've been there just about four years, and it's been a terrific, yeah. terrific run, a great group of people. And before your time at Quintiles, if I recall correctly, there really was only one other CEO in the history of the company, or certainly one great leader in Dennis Gillings, who founded the company over 30 years ago. What's it like to take the place of an icon uh, yeah. who continued on as executive chairman? So you're moving into a company that literally the founders' fingerprints and footprints are all over it. How did you find that transition? Yeah, I, I often say that we really have to stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us in these companies. And Dennis created a terrific foundation. He had terrific values. He was a visionary. He's a mathematician by training, so he was great with the numbers and a strong operator. And really for him, it was just a time in his life. He had run the company for 30 years very successfully, and it was a time in life when he wanted to evolve and, and do other things, including investing and be involved with other companies as well as Quintiles. And so we met, and I think we shared a vision for what the company could do. Interestingly, to get this job, and this might be interesting for your students, I had... 17 interviews 
And two of the longest ones were with Dennis himself. One was six hours long. So we spent six hours together on his private plane, flying to England. And during that time, we shared experiences, stories, values, views, and we just felt like uh, it was a match. And I have to say, he's been a terrific guide. He's let me run the company, always been there for me, has tremendous uh, experience in our business. So he's always got a great point of view to bring to things. And we continue to have a terrific relationship today. What a wonderful story. And, and soon after you went to the company, to Quintiles, uh, you took the, public, the company public for the second time in its history. That's right. We're a very interesting company at, again, 34 years old this year. We were private up to about 93 and then went public and were really a pretty go-go stock till about 2003. Like any company that's public for 10 years, we had our ups and downs during that period of time, but the company decided to go private at that time. Just given where the markets were, given where the company was, it made a lot of sense. And we get into that a little bit, but it made a lot of sense. We're a very positive private equity story. We restructured while private, and as part of that restructuring, we sold off some businesses that were less valuable for our future, great businesses, but less valuable for our future. And then we added some other capabilities to that period of time and really set ourselves up to go public again. And then in 2013, we went ahead and took the company public and have had a very successful run since then. And if I recall correctly, this is the second time at least that you've been involved in taking a, an institution public. You helped to take Accenture public as well That's several right. years earlier. That's right. I was blessed uh, with having, getting to do this twice. I think that was one <laughs> of the reasons why Quintiles liked my resume. In, in, as we were turning the century, Accenture was considering becoming the first larger services company to go public. At the time, there were some real questions because there weren't many companies like that that really went public. And so we went ahead, planned, and went public in 2001. And during that time, I was head of strategy. So I did a lot of the preparation. I had worked with the banks. I actually wrote a big part of our registration statement. So I was familiar with the process, had made presentations to analysts and things before we went public. And then as we were public, I had a, a really constructive level of involvement with how we thought about ourselves with analysts and positioned ourselves. And so I did feel pretty prepared when we did it again. And then the second time, I got to do it in the lead, which was fun. Even more fun. The yeah, spotlight. Fun. Absolutely. Now, the strategy for Quintiles, you've been evolving a very unique and different form of strategy for the company since you arrived. Perhaps you could share that. Yeah. Well, fundamentally, it, it is a company that has been built off many acquisitions, and, but a few really core things. We have tremendous quantitative and analytical expertise. We were founded by a statistician, and many of the things that we did in our early days were really trying to help figure out how we could make sure that drugs were safe using high-quality statistical methods. And so we have that great depth. We also have the most globality of any company of our type. We're in 106 countries. We have offices in over 65. So thanks to Dennis, actually, he went around and he planted the flag all around the world in Japan since 93, China since 97. So we were the most global. And then we made the best investments in technology. So we had a vision in about 2005 about how to use technology. So if you think about that deep expertise, the most globality, and the technology, what my job was, was really to make that come alive, create a couple of business segments that could take the most advantage of that. So we created two, one in product development, which helps the pharmaceutical customer who does clinical development, and the other one we call integrated healthcare services, which really provides services for other pharmaceutical customers and for healthcare providers, payers, et cetera. So that's the broader. So we. We put a strategy together leveraging those competitive advantages in those two segments. We've done very well. Mm -hmm. I do think it'd be worth saying, when we think about our vision though, and what 35,000 people get up every day and think about, we're trying to bring people and knowledge together for a healthier world. Mm -hmm. Essentially, if you think about the, the breadth and depth of this place, all over the world we have medical doctors. We have almost 1,000 medical doctors. We have 1,000 PhDs. We're the size of a good-sized teaching hospital in terms of that talent. And if we can bring that knowledge together with our great people around the world, and we put that to work for patients, it's really powerful. So you've really broadened the historical view of Quintiles, it really starting as a CRO, a clinical research organization, to go beyond to be a source of innovation uh, yes. in the world of healthcare. 
As you look at the healthcare industry, Tom, as you look to the next five dash ten years, you've already made the move to be a knowledge-based provider, if you will. What do you see uh, as the overall industry evolves and, and the impact of those changes that you see on the offerings and the capabilities of, of Quintos? Yeah, I first I'd start with the pharmaceutical industry. I think it's a fascinating industry. If you think about these companies that, that made drugs that have been in the business for a long time, you really had to own everything from the origination of the drug all the way through the commercialization of it all over the world. So if you go back to perhaps the early stages of insulin, you literally had to almost start in the farm and make sure you had the right animals and then bring it all the way to make sure it was safe for people around the world to take. And so these were huge vertically integrated enterprises. I think through the 90s were really go-go years with a, a tremendous investment, tremendous return associated with the pharmaceutical industry. And they got bigger and bigger and are now some of the world's largest companies. So the opportunity for us, we're a service provider. And what we really do is disrupt a lot of their value chain. We go in and we say, how can we do this process more efficiently than you as a large vertically integrated provider or company? And so we, what we try to do as we've grown up is we try to provide services, many of which were done by the pharmaceutical firms themselves for many years, but at high quality, lower cost in less time. And if we can bring that value proposition to our customers, then there's an enormous opportunity. So you're bringing yourself from being, in a way, an outsourced provider to being a, a legitimate and strong side-by-side -side global partner. With I think that's right. We started out more just answering the mail, as I say. We, mm -hmm. we do little services that they asked us to do. And now we're at the point where we think about what they should do, mm -hmm. and we approach them with ideas about how they can do it better. Mm -hmm. And on our best day, we're in the CEO suite talking about how we can partner together. In Boston, we see a tremendous evolution of the biotech world, and I imagine that uh, they're also a part of this disruption taking place in healthcare in a major way. I imagine that Quintiles is very engaged with the, the newcomers, if you will, to the industry alongside of the, the stalwarts, the, the traditional big pharma companies. It must be interesting in terms of navigating that divide with having very different cultures that you're engaging with, different styles of leadership. Uh, what's the secret to being able to navigate successfully uh, in a very ambidextrous way? Well, it's a, it's a very insightful comment. If you think about this, this disruption of the industry value chain, in a way the biotechs are part of it because a lot of the, the discovery into research that's happening is starting in academia and then moving into small companies and then being purchased by the larger pharmaceutical firms. So they have now, biotech has now become part of the value chain and then also operates independently. For us, what we try to do is we try to take all the lessons we've learned from working with big pharma and medium-sized pharma and apply them with emerging biopharma. And what's interesting for them is you may have 10 people and a molecule and they don't have clinical development skills or commercialization skills, but we do. We have 35,000 people. We've been doing this for 30 years. They might be doing it for a year. So we can literally be their entire development arm or their entire commercialization arm. And so it's a huge opportunity to work together. We have one company here in Boston with, that we've been with since the very beginning. And now they're worth well over a billion dollars, very successful, starting to commercialize. And we basically partnered with them all the way from just a few people. Must be very rewarding to see uh, your customers grow up, literally, it before is. your very eyes. Let's turn to leadership for a few moments. Uh, as the CEO of 35,000 employees, uh, uh, the tone at the top matters in any organization. You've got customers counting on you, your employees, the investors. Uh, what's your approach to leadership as you take this company forward? Well, I think it's a, it's a deep question, and we've been working on it, in fact. And a few things. First, for me, you always have to be aware of your stakeholders. So our stakeholders are patients, in fact, because we are in a healthcare business, our employees, our customers, and our shareholders. And to be honest, Ken, if we're not satisfying all of those stakeholders, then we're not successful as a business. So we're very, very thoughtful about that. In general, though, the way I try to run the company is if it's good for the customer, it's good for us. And what that means is if we're doing things that add value to customers,
then it spills out because it creates jobs for people and that creates profits for our, our uh, shareholders. And so the virtuous cycle for us is around making sure the customer is successful. And one of the things that we've come to say, we did a little branding exercise a couple of years ago and the management team was together and one phrase came out that was very important, that if we increase our customer's probability of success, we will be successful. And if you think about our industry where you have pharmaceutical firms and it's all about the probability the compound will work and the probability that it helps patients. And so if we help them with those probabilities, whether it's commercializing the drug, helping develop the drug, uh, thinking of different ways to run the portfolio, all those things help them with their probability of success. So we center on that as a team. Interesting. Goes back to the, st the statistical background of, with probability at the mm -hmm. core of what you're thinking. Exactly. Uh, as we think about leadership, we also often talk about, of course, values and culture. The role of values and culture in the company, how has it evolved over the years, uh, and what mm -hmm. do you see moving forward? Well, it's huge. If you think about what we do every day where we work with clinical research, work with patients around the world, you have to start with the values. And this company has a great set of values. They've been in place for many years. It's an easy acronym, TLC with a high IQ. And that's teamwork, leadership, customer, but importantly, integrity and quality. And we just have to be a company that delivers quality results. We can't get things wrong. There's a patient on the other end of this. So we have to be high quality. And then we have to have the highest integrity. We have global compliance regulations in all aspects of our business. So it's absolutely crucial that we adhere to good clinical practice, good lab practice, these global standards. So for us, that value system is really our, at our core. TLC with a high IQ, very memorable indeed. <laughs> uh, let's talk ethics for a moment. You mentioned it as part of the fabric of the company. And uh, of course, in the business school environment, we're very aggressively working with our next generation of leaders to help them be prepared to be able to have informed judgment in, mm -hmm. in their dealings and, and also helping them recognize they may face an ethical dilemma as soon as the first day in the job mm -hmm. as they go to work. Is there an ethical dilemma you might be willing to share with us where you faced a challenge, whether at Quintiles or in your prior yeah. career uh, in, as a consultant where uh, you uh, really felt the need and were able to speak your values? How did you, how did you engage the dilemma and, and, and resolve it when you knew you were facing a number of different pressures perhaps? It's interesting. I'll, I'll share a couple of things on that. For me personally, I always think back to an experience that happened in my 20s when I met with an executive and I felt like he lied to me. And I remember I was about 25 years old. I worked with a high integrity organization. And I, I really think it's important for people to try to work with high integrity organizations. And, and here was this very um, a very concrete example of somebody who wasn't telling me the truth, who was in a very senior position. And I ended up uh, moving away from that individual, moving away from that. And I think from that moment, I made a decision that I just wasn't going to work in an environment that wasn't ethical. And then coming here to Quintiles and even at my previous companies, I think you do as an executive see ethical dilemmas and they are wide ranging. They can be ranging from uh, sexual harassment, they can be ranging from Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, and it is just very important to try to recognize that you are an example as an executive, and your company uh, simply has to be an ethical company to really survive in this sophisticated world. I think it's just, um, you have to trust your North Star most of the time if there's an ethical situation coming up, it does hit you a little bit in here. If you, if you have a good set of values, it hits you in here. And it is your obligation to raise your hand and bring it to the right place if you run into an ethical issue. And I applaud all the folks who uh, carefully think about these situations that they're in and just make sure ethical issues are handled the right way. So you really followed your North Star early in your career, made that very important decision you've lived to all the way through. Uh, in leading the quintiles with a, a wonderful values-based culture, uh, beyond the values, are there other mechanisms that you see or have in place or, or approaches within the company to ensure that it's, it's safe, if you will, for an employee if they see it, yeah. something that they actually say something and bring it to the attention of, of leadership? Yes, we have a few things, and I'm sure I'll leave a few things out, but 
we have an e-learning environment, and one of the courses is around compliance and integrity. And we actually start that off by me sitting with our chief compliance officer, and we talk about integrity and we talk about that story and how important ethics really are to what we do every day. And what we do is we have a hotline so that it's easily accessible, always monitored, and we just encourage people, if they even have a question, even if they're not sure, go ahead and talk to the, or call the hotline, talk mm -hmm. to somebody who's an expert, try to understand what you're seeing or what you're feeling or something that perhaps a colleague's doing if it bothers you. And, and the company has a tremendous track record of just making sure the right conversations happen, things are tracked down and dealt with as necessary. Making it safe, yes. safe to communicate. Wonderful. Uh, leadership, uh, further sta statement relative to leadership development. Mm. Uh, recently, Quintiles won a wonderful award uh, from HR.com about innovation and leadership development. Mm -hmm. uh, how did this come about? Is this a long-standing tradition at the company, or is this something you've brought to the company as an emphasis point? Yeah, well, it's an interesting company. We've actually, over time, created many of the leaders of the CRO industry. So if you look across at our competition, the number two guy at one company, the number one guy at another company, you know, are our former employees. So we do have a tremendous track record of leadership development. But what I've tried to do since coming there is formalize it a little bit. And some of this recent acknowledgement really comes from the fact that we've got a very proactive program to try to develop our top few hundred people, and then it'll also trickle into the organization. What it really ranges around is uh, based on some of the work that Noel Tishy and, G and GE did over the years around action learning, around putting people into real situations with case studies, uh, what we're doing with our executive team is taking them out, giving them training, giving them experiences in action learning, having them work on company problems, and then through that learning, really in almost an apprentice type role, how to think better together. And that's what we do. To be honest with you, we all benefit. When I help teach that class, I always benefit from what I'm hearing from our team. And then I think the team gets a lot out of it. And what it ultimately lets us do is it lets us delegate authority through the organization because we have a consistent view about the quality of a decision. What is a good quality decision? And so with great leadership development, people have better career paths, and I think as an organization we make better decisions. And we're very lucky and fortunate and grateful to you and the company for being involved with us in our Master of Science and Management Studies program where some of the very same aspects you've just described, uh, you and your colleagues are bringing to the classroom uh, to the next mm -hmm. generation. Uh, we're deeply grateful indeed. Well, we're very pleased. We have recruited quite a number of people out of your business school. You may know I was looking at the long list before. In fact, I can't even <laughs> reel it all off here but we're extremely pleased with the quality of people and you know, the style of people that you have here. I think you have a nice intersection between the EQ, the IQ, and good business learnings that's really helped us out. Our vision is to create value for the world and we hope we're doing so for you and your customers everywhere. A uh, couple, two last questions. The first really relates to personal measures. Personal measures of success. How do you measure success? Our students are always asking the question, well, how will I know if I'm successful? Mm -hmm. How should I measure how I'm successful? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's becoming with people like Clay Christensen writing books like How Do You Measure Your Life? I think it's really coming on to the stage that it's about a lot more than money. And I have come to think, Ken, that for everybody it's a little bit different. Different people at different stages, different goals, um, measure things differently. For me personally, I came from a family that didn't have much money. Both of my parents actually died in debt. And I always felt like I wanted to either be successful at what I did or have a lot of fun. So, you know, as it's turned out, I've had a terrific career and I've just been able to continue to have great uh, experiences with people, learn a lot, uh, contribute. And so for me, I've actually gone away from material measures. I've gone away from, um, I'd say, career stage measures at this point. And now I'm starting to flip around and say, okay, I've been very lucky, I've worked very hard, and now what can I start contributing back based on what I've learned? So my, my approach, I think for many years, I did want to continue to achieve. 
And now that I've gotten to this spot, I'm starting to think a lot more about giving back. Thank you. One final question for our students as they contemplate leaving the safety and security of the academic environment to pursue their personal and professional lives, what advice might you have for our students? Well, a few things, I guess. First of all, you're, if you can, coming out of a great school like this, try to pick a great company to work with. Because some companies have paths that pull you along, and some companies you really have to push yourself along. For me, at least in my career, and even with my own kids, if you can get in a company that trains you, pulls you along, it gives you tremendous opportunity through that, that you may not get otherwise. Both can work. There are certainly models of both that can work. But I do think if you can be with a great company, that's great. The second one, though, is regardless of whether you're with a great company or one that perhaps is a, an upstart company, working with great people is key. I will say for me, Ken, the most rewarding thing in my career has been working for people I respect and with people I respect. When I think back on some of the most positive things about my career, they're often the toughest moments, but the moments that we accomplished a lot. And I think you can only do that when you're surrounded by great people. And so I think uh, as long as you work with and for great people, you are the great company, you know, those types of things really help you. Wonderful words of wisdom, Tom. We've been in conversation with Tom Pike, CEO of Quintiles. Thank you for joining us, and thank you again, Tom. Thank you.